Welcome to the Golden State Media Concepts Sex Podcast, a show that examines all aspects of sexuality, from physical to emotional to spiritual. Join our hosts as they discuss age-old questions, common misconceptions, and the latest topics surrounding sex. They'll tackle topics about sexuality from the complicated to the hilarious and everything in between. GSMC Sex Podcast is your show for all of your questions about sex, even some you might not have thought of yet. folks, welcome to the GSMC Sex Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, I'm Ainsley Caswell, and thank you for coming to this entire hour, which is dedicated to the topic of communication during sex. Or you could say communication during intimacy. I've touched on this topic a couple of times during earlier episodes because it's really all-encompassing. It comes into so many different areas of your intimacy, but it's really time that an entire episode is dedicated to this topic because it's so important. So first, we're going to dive into the ways that you can communicate before you're intimate with your partner, the ways that you can communicate during intimacy with your partner, and the ways that you can communicate after. And then to sum everything up, I'm going to try to give you some examples without getting too specific, of course. Now I want to jump right into how you can communicate with your partner before you get into bed or wherever you choose to dive into your escapades. This actually, this might be the first thing that you think about, but this isn't actually on my list of stuff to touch on, is sexting. The first thing that I have on my list is just the general bullet point of express desire, but I think that I should throw in sexting because that's how we do that now, or just a messenger also. Just the over the overall idea of sending a text message to someone that is an eggplant, just that concept is what I'm getting at. You understand. Okay, so expressing desire to your partner nowadays, that can be everything from sending an actual instant picture of your boobs or your junk, to um, an, an emoji of an eggplant, to, um, to the actual words of, let's do it later, to more ambiguous stuff, to um, leaving a note on the counter, assuming that you live with your partner, a note on the counter that's, um, you know, your lipstick print and a poem, to uh, just, you know, a hand-drawn heart. That, it can... This is a very general idea of continuing to express to your partner that you have an interest, which is romantic and sexual and or both, all of those things. When I tend to see stories of people who have had a loss of a sexual relationship in their partnership, there's a lot of dialogue or a lot of talk of they do not express desire. They do not want me. And I'm no therapist. I don't see patients or anything. But these are the types of things that people seem to say. And this is very much included in communication. Communication doesn't have to be limited to the words that you verbally say to each other when you see each other in person or on the phone or when you're just limited to speaking when you are in bed sexually, when you're doing sexual things. Communication is everything from the words that you say to each other to the actions to the things that you do or do not say to each other in text messages or things that you leave for each other, gifts, presents, notes, pretty much everything. So your partner is able to glean from those things that you do or don't do for each other or do or don't say to each other that all sort of bleeds into your intimate relationship as well. And 
Then the rest of these items are more specific about if you do venture very deliberately into the arena of we are talking intimately about what we're going to do in our intimate life. And what I mean by that is if you sit down with your partner and start to talk about things like your sexual fantasies. So if you make that choice, and it does have to be a choice, not many people outside of the first three months honeymoon period of any relationship, I wouldn't say that a whole lot of couples accidentally stumble into that conversation of discussing their sexual fantasies. So it does need to be a purposeful choice that you need to make when you're in a certain stage of your relationship with your partner. So the idea that you sit down and discuss your sexual fantasies with your partner does assume that you're comfortable enough to do that. So hopefully, you're able to sit down with your partner and say, here's what I'm thinking about, and here's what I'm feeling, and here's what I would like to do. Because there is a difference between fantasizing about something and actually wanting to do it, and also wanting to do it with your partner. Sometimes there are fantasies that you don't actually want to carry out with your partner. Sometimes there are fantasies that you want to do with another person, and then you have to discuss it with your partner if you have one. So there's a whole bunch of scenarios that may or may not apply to you. But let's say that you have fantasies that you want to discuss with your partner, and you sit down and you have those conversations. The goal there ultimately is for you to share freely with each other and then find intersection or any overlap or agreement between the two of you. That would ultimately be the goal within those conversations. At a bare minimum, two people in a partnership would have a free conversation that is judgment-free to be able to share the information, feel accepted. Maybe you find new things that you can share with each other during your intimate time, and then it's sort of a win-win for everybody. Maybe you find some things that you don't want to do together, but you've shared the information and you feel unburdened and you feel better. And possibly you discover that there's some incompatibility there and that defines some of your choices going forward. Some bad things that may come out of it is maybe some judgment does come out there and maybe that doesn't make you feel good ultimately, but again, it defines some of your choices going forward. You want to feel safe during these conversations. That's another goal. And if you don't, you have to try to make the best choices you can again going forward and in the future. Speaking of safety, that's another aspect of communication. I think a lot of women can struggle with this because of how society can dictate our roles from a very young age. So I say this because I think I have a hard time understanding how communication is important in my sexual life because I didn't understand that I had the ability to communicate in my sexual freedom. I had no freedom to communicate in my sexual life for a very long time, and I didn't understand that I wasn't the only one feeling that way. It's a very difficult thing for women to understand our sexual autonomy because we're taught such traditional gender roles. And so communication is something that we have to learn in a totally different way than men do because of the way that we're taught traditional gender roles. And that can vary from society to society. So it's very difficult for us to separate that in so many different ways depending on where we're raised and where we grow up. And this can be directly linked to our safety in our sexual relationships. So that starts to get very complicated depending on what you're talking about, but it kind of all boils down to the more that women learn to directly advocate for ourselves, the safer we can be in our sexual relationships, and that seems to be true across the board. Something else that that reminds me of is an openness to share history. And something that I feel like I've experienced a few times with prior partners is sometimes men are reluctant to hear your history, but that seems to be linked to ego very often. 
But sharing your history with your partner is not only very positive, and it's often about learning about your partner's prior experiences, but often about their likes and dislikes. But it can be about safety. It can be about health safety. It can be about emotional safety. It can be about habitual safety, their likes and dislikes, which can be safety because of any trauma that they've endured. And if their communication skills are good, they can give you any advice based on what they've learned. The goal of conversations like that, assuming that they go well, is that you can share with each other what your experiences were and what you each learned from them so that you can either repeat things that you want to do again or you can never do things that you never want to do again. Or if you had somebody in your life that you liked and they did something that you liked, you can pass that on to your partner. Or exactly the opposite, if you had somebody let's hope somebody that you like just fine, but they did something that you just don't want to deal with ever again, you can pass that on to your partner and say, you know, this thing that I just don't ever want to deal with, um, please don't ever do that. Like take off your shoes in the middle of the doorway in the dark and leave them there. That'd be great. I didn't have a boyfriend that did that. That's fine. You know what's a a pre-gaming thing that you guys can do that I could talk way too long about so I can dedicate a whole other episode to it um, is watch porn together. So let's fast forward through the details and just acknowledge that, first of all, couples watch porn together. Second, there is a multitude of different types of porn and places to get porn and niches of porn out there. So let's just acknowledge all those things together. And let's say that you and your partner watch some porn together. It's extremely productive for you and your partner to watch some pornography and talk about it, discuss it, not necessarily to critique it, but really in whatever way you want. You can discuss it in ways of, I didn't like that. I did like that. I would like to try that. That's interesting to me. I think you would look good doing that. I would think you would look good doing that to me. There are no rules. You can say and do whatever you want. Take notes while you're watching the porn. Draw pictures while you're watching the porn. I don't care. Well, listen to this podcast while you're watching the porn. I don't care. Also, if you're going to write stuff down while you're watching the porn, another thing you can do is make something like a bucket list or a wish list. Make a list together of stuff you want to do later. I know people are overenthusiastic. Men are overenthusiastic sometimes. We got to do all this stuff right now. Right now. Right 20 minutes. Give me tw- just give me 20 minutes. We'll bet we'll do it all. Do it. They don't have to. Nobody has to do it all right now. Nobody nobody said you have to do it right now. Make a list and then keep it in the nightstand. It's a to-do list for later. Nobody said you had to do all that stuff right now. Nobody said you had to do the wheelbarrow right now. Nobody said that. It's just goals. Which leads me to my next point, which is keep learning. Keep learning. You don't have to, there's no deadline If anything, it's the exact opposite. You have to elongate this process. If you're in a committed long-term relationship and and you want to stay with this person, if you're interested in being with them forever, if you're married to this person, if your goal is to be with them for a long time, you're supposed to elongate this process. Keeping your relationship diverse and interesting is sort of, again, your, your goal. So you can't and shouldn't do everything in 20 minutes in one day. You need goals. You need a list. You need, a, you need things to strive for. Don't a lot of people make relationship gardening analogies? It's like planting stuff and waiting for it to grow. So that's why when you, just because you saw the spinning chandelier move or whatever it's called on a, you know, internet porn, that you have to plant it in the ground and then cultivate it and wait. And then, that's, does that make any sense? The only other thing I have to give you advice on is 
do you not have sexual dreams? I mean, not everybody does, but an awful lot of people do. If you do, talk to your partner about them. How many times has some creep tried to slide into your DMs and say, yo, I had a dream about you last night. And you're like, oh, really? Oh, really? How'd it go? And he goes, oh, it was real good. It was real good. And you're like, "Mm mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know what he's doing, right? You know what he's doing? I had a guy do that to me twice before I figured out what he was doing, and it was no good. It was no good. No good, folks. So if you have a sexy dream about your partner, tell them. Tell them, because they know what's going on. They know what's up. They know that you are up to no good, and guess what? Neither are they. They're up to no good either, and they're probably not going to tell you. So make them tell you by broaching the topic first and uh, tell them about your dirty, filthy dream that you thought belonged quietly inside your head, but it doesn't. It doesn't. Just tell your partner. And if they don't receive it well, well, then send it to me. Slide into my DMs, okay? Um, So coming up next, I will tell you what to say during intimacy because communication doesn't stop when uh, you slide into more than their DMs. What? See you in a minute. Still on the search of that one true love? On the limbo in this crazy world of dating, marriage, relationships. Well, listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Relationship Podcast. Your one-stop podcast for everything about relationships. Folks, welcome back to the GSMC Sex Podcast. This is Ainsley, and you are listening to my episode on communication. We are moving on from how to communicate before intimacy to how do you communicate during intimacy? Because just because you got them into bed, so to speak, doesn't mean that you stop communicating. So what happens? Well, chances are you might be in the dark. So body language It doesn't completely go out the window, but there's an awful lot of cues that disappear. So we're not going to be talking a whole lot about body language. Body language is very pivotal during intimacy, obviously. It mostly encompasses your body, which is very active. But we're not going to talk about that, mostly. Mostly, we're going to be talking about using your words or not using them. Because the absence of language during communication is pivotal, especially during intimacy. So first, I want to talk about admitting when stuff doesn't work. Because when stuff goes wrong or doesn't work in intimacy, people panic. But they don't direct their panic outward. A lot of times they turn it inward and it turns into blame or shame or anger or frustration. And they don't think it's about the other person. A lot of times they think it's about them. As a quick example, I just want to highlight when myself and a partner handled this well, which is rare, but I just want to, and I'm not doing it out of ego. I just want to say like, oh, we actually did this the right way. And it was quick, efficient, and it was over and done with, and neither of us had any baggage about it. And it was conveniently related to a toy. And maybe that's why it was so easy, because the toy was almost like a neutral third party. We had a toy, and it was supposed to be a couple's toy. 
And it was um, one of those toys that went partially inside of my vaginal canal and the rest of it sat outside and it was meant to be used during vaginal intercourse. And we tried it and neither of us liked it and then, but we saw it through and we used it to completion and and then and then we talked about it the next day even we gave it like overnight to kind of marinate in our brains and then we discussed it and we just sort of looked at each other and we were like what do you think and we were like no i'm not really feeling it and and that, and that was it we didn't speculate about user error he didn't appear to speculate about his anatomy i didn't speculate about my anatomy neither of us speculated about our ability it was just an acceptance of yeah, I don't think this is for us, and we don't really like it. But we're not mad about it. We're just going to say no and move on. And that was one of the most liberating experiences of my entire life, I think. And if I had any sort of recommendation, I would say approach any sort of discussion with your partner, especially about intimacy, if you can, like that, and say, yeah, this thing just didn't seem to work for us and I'm okay with that and we don't ever need to approach it again if if we don't want to. And that's fine. And it doesn't really have anything to do with measuring our adequacy. Ideally, that's the way that you would approach and exit those experiences. And you can also do that for positive ones too. Oh, look, this is something that we enjoy and we don't need to shame ourselves for indulging in it. That's refreshing. But specifically, I was referencing acknowledging when things don't work, because the opposite of that is stuff doesn't work, and then you bury it and don't acknowledge it, and then you don't talk about it, and it perpetuates. So that's the opposite of that. So when things don't work, especially when you're trying something new, it's best and sometimes it's best to wait until afterwards. You don't need to acknowledge this in real time. You can wait until afterwards and say, hey, that thing, it wasn't my favorite. Or more specifically, that didn't go the way that I thought it was going to. So, like, we don't have to do it again. In my opinion, that kind of phrasing puts really low pressure on both of you because it sort of means that it just didn't work out and it's no one's fault and that's probably true. You're probably not pulling a cop out or telling a white lie when you say something like that. There's a good chance that things like toys or positions are the fault of basic anatomy and anatomy differences that have nothing to do with you or your partner or skill level or anything like that. Like when I used a toy with my partner and it just didn't work for us, there's a good chance that the generic build of that toy just didn't work for the shape of my body and his body together, and it had nothing to do with anything. As a matter of fact, when I originally tried it with, before he even got involved in the equation, I didn't like it from the get-go. So I didn't really, and I didn't feel bad about it. So, and I wouldn't try it again with another partner. So it just had no bearing on either one of our values, and I think that's important to think of going forward with any partnership when you're talking about stuff that doesn't turn out the way that you think it's going to, regardless of why you're trying it or with who. Now, when you're giving that type of feedback or talking about how something turned out, there's a few things to keep in mind about your feedback. This is important when you're a very jaded, bitter person like I am. So I encourage you to take these with a grain of salt, especially when it comes to my monotone voice. Um, try to be nice, try to be patient, and be helpful. And this is important not just for the future of your healthy relationship and your continued equal exchange of responsibilities with your partner and all that lovely rainbow stuff or whatever, but also for their feelings, I think. Look, you like them, right? So that's the point. Be nice because you like them. Be patient because this is a sensitive topic and you don't want to be rude. And be helpful because 
ego largely drives our sexual decisions. And if you're not helpful, people are too close to the topic to be able to really see problem solving. It's difficult for us to be able to problem solve in the moment because we are largely driven by passion and ego and all these things that really get in our face in the moment. So you have to really slow things down. And I'm not trying to be stereotypical. I said nothing about women slowing this down for men. I'm talking about everybody. Every single person doesn't understand what they're supposed to be doing or when. And I'm and that's just across the board, including myself. I don't know what I'm doing at what time. I'm not talking about sex either. What lane am I in? I don't know. where. Who am I responding to in this email? Where is my phone? I don't know what's going on at what time. Please be helpful. Where is my phone? Dirty talk is something that we maybe should have covered earlier, but we did talk a little about sexting, which is very much dirty talk. But when we talk about dirty talk, I feel like there's still an image of people in bed doing it, whispering in each other's ear. You can tell me if I'm wrong or you can bring up an image in your head and see if that conflicts. But in general, I feel like there's often, especially since the reimagination of what erotic literature is since the boom of Fifty Shades and the visibility of BDSM in pop culture, again, with the help of Fifty Shades of Grey, Dirty Talk is still, it, it's seen as a bedroom activity. Dirty Talk is still foreplay. It's very much involved in foreplay. It's something that you whisper to your partner across the dinner table. It's something that you say in the car when you're almost home. But it's also communication that happens in the bed during the act. It doesn't stop. But all Dirty Talk, no matter where it happens, is very much a preference and a spectrum that's really where it varies a lot from a lot of other forms of communication. A lot of other forms of communication don't delve into the type of extremities that dirty talk does. It says it right in the name. It's dirty talk. It's meant to be extreme. We expect it to be extreme. It covers all the words, all the things. It happens during the act. It's dirty. That's what it is. So therefore, it sort of has no limits. And so within that whole definition, we understand that it's going to be extreme. And so there are going to be preferences within it. There's a lot of things within the realms of dirty talk that a huge amount of people are going to find unattractive and flat out offensive. So if you engage in dirty talk with your partner you may need to establish verbal boundaries, not just because they may find something offensive, which is unfortunate, and I know it doesn't make you that excited, but you do have to establish those boundaries. But if they just find something kind of unattractive, and I'm going to use the word moist as an example just because that word is stereotypically hated, there's a, just a lot of people in the world that hate that word, Let's say that you have a boyfriend that wants to whisper in your ear, do I make you moist? What if you date a guy that wants to say that to you and that's like your word that you hate? What if that's a thing? You're going to have to tell him. You're going to have to. Sorry. You're going to have to have that conversation with him. And then what next? There's going to have to be a larger conversation because clearly he's a talker. What else is he going to say? What is he going to say next? Obviously, there's going to need to be a conversation where you corral this guy. And more than that, I would be very curious about his motivation. Some people talk because it excites them. Other people talk because it excites them to see you excited. They think that their talking excites you. You need to see what their motivation is for why they're speaking. I was with a guy once who essentially taught me to speak while we were intimate because I didn't really understand that I was allowed to say things. And he was interested in having me talk because he wanted to hear things. 
He wanted to get feedback. But he was also interested in dirty talk. He, he wanted to speak too, but he wanted to hear me also. And I didn't understand I was allowed to do it. It's one of the reasons I referenced getting permission, because some of us don't really understand that we're allowed to talk until someone tells us that we're allowed. And not only is that a very interesting concept, but it's, it's interesting to get prompted and understand that other people want to hear, and it excites them. That leads me, I guess, to listening. Communication is, of course, not just making noise and making your needs and wants known. Communication is a huge back and forth, and part of that is listening. A lot of people, when they're engaged in intimacy, they get very wrapped up in the experience. And if I wanted to be stereotypical, I would say, men struggle with this, question mark? And listening is very important. And oftentimes, when we're wrapped up in experiences, we forget to listen. It's not that women don't do this. I find myself forgetting to listen constantly. I think men tend to get a reputation for not listening specifically in sexual experiences because they are known for being very sexual beings, and so they're known to get distracted during sexual encounters. In my personal experience, I have had more than one encounter with a man where even if I try to make my needs known during a sexual encounter, he will listen, modify his behavior for five to ten seconds— and then go right back to what he was doing. That's a form of listening because it's retention of the information. If you're unable to retain what I just told you, that's a form of being unable to listen. So be cognizant or at least attempt to be cognizant of retaining what you're attempting to listen to because that's a portion of your listening skills. I'm going to try to wrap up by summarizing what I will call the different types of sex that you can fall into if you're not being a good communicator. And I will call these selfish sex, sacrifice sex, and duty sex. And if you're someone who is performing any of these, I believe you're not being a good communicator in your intimacy. Selfish sex is if you're the type of person where you're generally cognizant of what is going on and you're not communicating or listening to your partner. If you are performing selfish sex, you're cognizant that your partner is either disconnected or not enjoying themselves, but you're hell-bent on finishing for your own satisfaction. That means you're just there to fulfill your needs and the sex is now completely selfish. If you are in a sexual act and it is now sacrifice sex, you are fully cognizant that you are now no longer enjoying the experience. Perhaps you're actively uncomfortable or actively in pain, but you're attempting to remain there and sustain the experience for the benefit of your partner or at least what you assume is for the benefit of your partner, because you're also not communicating that. You're not attempting to check in with them for their benefit or to communicate your discomfort. Neither one of these things is being communicated. So you just remain there, maintain the status quo, hoping that it ends at some point, and that's why it remains sacrifice for the sexual act. The last one, duty sex, is where you convince yourself to participate in the sexual act because your partner has actively expressed that they want to, but you don't want to, but you do anyway because they have said that they want to. You more or less feel guilt over it because you think it's your job. You don't feel forced at all. No one has forced you into it, but you feel it's your job or your duty. This often happens in marriages or any sort of living arrangement. I'm not trying to place any sort of coercion on top of these scenarios. These are generally situations that we have created inside of our own heads, usually as the act is is occurring in real time. And personally, I think this happens because we often put so much pressure on ourselves inside of these, not just situations, but 
the relationships that we have outside of these situations. That was fun, not depressing at all. Maybe I should go back to dirty talk. Should have wrapped up with that one. So now that we've talked about how to communicate while you're doing it, how do you communicate after? Do you yell at each other through the bathroom door? No, it's more than that. So stick around for that. And then even later, I'll give you some specific examples of how to talk to each other. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Sex Podcast. I'm Ainsley, of course, and you're jumping in right in the middle. Well, hopefully not. Hopefully you joined us for the first half where we talked about communication in bed or rather out of bed because we discussed communication before you are intimate and communication during intimacy, which doesn't have to be in the bed, does it? You're creative people, aren't you? So now we're going to discuss communication after intimacy, and that also can take place anywhere, right? In bed, out of bed, in the kitchen, standing in front of the fridge, eating leftover macaroni and cheese. What? I don't do that. So talking about what you liked, first and foremost, is probably your best option because that's a very positive topic, right? But I think a lot of us don't do that because of simple things like shame and embarrassment. Do you often start conversations with anyone, but even your partner? Do you start those conversations with, I really liked when your hands were in my butt last night. That's not really a sentence that easily comes to the tip of your tongue. You could talk about where the tip of your tongue was last night. I don't know. I don't know what you were doing. But in general, not a lot of people broach these topics over breakfast. And possibly this is where we go wrong. Unlike sexual spontaneity, which is very exciting and a lot of people find very appealing, logistical discussion of our sexual preferences is often not a spontaneous occurrence, and it doesn't really work spontaneously. You and your partner may need to set very, very clear parameters and maybe even clear dates and times to sit down and discuss and reflect on this type of thing. Kind of like we discussed earlier when talking about fantasies, because not to call to sort of an overused, watered-down term, but you're more or less creating a safe space for you and your partner because this is a very touchy topic that involves a lot of sensitive issues and Big things that involve people's egos. So that's really where it's that combination of things that come into play. And so that's why clearly communicating what you want to say can get lost very, very easily unless you clearly sit down, set aside time, listen very carefully to what the other person is saying, and take the time to communicate what you're saying very carefully and clearly. And as we discussed earlier, try to be nice and patient and helpful in all those rainbow things that don't come naturally to a cold robot like myself. 
So when you're discussing these things with your partner and specifically let's start with the stuff you liked, even then you sort of have to put it in a good positive light because people can inadvertently, because we're very sensitive about these things, even if you're saying something positive, they can inadvertently spin it as a negative. Let's say that you and your partner had a great encounter the night before, and then you discuss it the next day, and you say something like, I really, really, really liked when you did that one thing. If you highlight that a little too much, they might think that you hated everything else. So it's about giving an accurate impression of what's really going on, having constructive discussion about it, and being proactive and moving forward with what you want to do again which is an entirely separate and equally important point, which is be clear about what you want to revisit again versus what you may have enjoyed but may have just been a one-off. Because there's a huge difference between something that you enjoyed and definitely want to do again versus something that you're glad that you did, but you're not really interested in making it a part of your regular routine. I would think of it like food. Food is something that you have to have every day, or at least on a regular basis. And let's say that you had escargot and you didn't hate it. You thought it was fine. But are you going to start having it daily or weekly? Are you going to do that? Maybe not. Maybe it was just the exotic thing that you had because you had the opportunity and you did enjoy it and you thought it was good, but you had your fill and that was it. It's okay if you feel that way about sexual experiences, too. Another analogy could be, I'm thinking about roller coasters. Think of, think of yourself at an amusement park, and you have a selection of roller coasters, and you tried five of them, but you only really liked one of them, and that's the one you want to keep going on 50 times before you leave. The rest of them were fine, but you have no desire to go on any of them again. There's this one that you're obsessed with. That's fine. That's your preference. And it's okay if you indulge in that one. It's okay. And your parents are weird if they make you feel guilty about it. So talk it through with your partner if they're on the same page with you. And if they're not, maybe they're not. And if they are, then that's great. And then you can compare notes about stuff that you want to do in the future. Because dissenting on this type of thing is okay. You each had a totally different experience with whatever you were doing. You did, but you also had a shared experience, and you can discuss that, and you can disagree on whatever you experienced because you did have your individual perspectives. And this doesn't have to be an end-all, be-all. You can do similar things in the future, but try them differently. And if you're going to do something like that, that's where it's really important to be constructive and not blame each other for doing something, quote, wrong, unquote. There's no wrong way to do many sexual things, unless, of course, you're taking power away from somebody without their consent. That type of thing is wrong. So when you're doing this type of thing, having these conversations with somebody you're in an intimate relationship with, it's really about going forward with permission, consent, clear communication. Do you want to do this? Are you willing to do this with me? Are we both on the same page? Because in most of these situations, in many partnerships, most people are fighting stagnancy, or at least they should be fighting stagnancy. Some people end up fighting each other because they think they're fighting each other. In many instances, though, they're fighting stagnancy because when their sexual relationship or their intimacy was good, it was still interesting. They were still discovering things about each other. They were probably still communicating fairly well. And then somewhere along the line, things got stagnant, boring, their communication broke down, and then the partners start fighting each other when really they're fighting a lot of things that are a part of that stagnancy and they forget how to communicate. Partners who are good at communicating it's not that they don't have stagnancy. They have it. They have a lot of it. They're just actively fighting against it. They're actively fighting against any stagnancy that works its way inevitably into their relationship. But what if some people want the monotony? What if they want the same thing over and over again? That still requires immense amounts of communication because... 
to maintain the same thing over time requires the communication and consent of both parties anyway. When I lurk on a message boards looking for stories of infidelity or cheating or sexual relationships gone wrong or sexual relationships gone right, I see an awful lot of firsthand accounts of my partner wants the same thing all the time from the day that I met them and I don't understand. And even if there's an incompatibility issue between partners like that, which there very clearly seems to be, there also, first and foremost, seems to be a massive issue with communication. Because there are some couples who make sexual incompatibility work through modification in their relationships. And that could mean almost anything. That could mean toys. That could mean literature. That could mean outside partners, like being open or poly. That could mean getting a specialty medical diagnosis if there's a medical condition at play. It could mean swinging. Swinging parties are still a thing. There's a lot of things that people could discuss and do discuss in their relationship and then get assistance for. But then there's an awful lot of people that don't talk about any of this stuff. They never get any of it addressed in their relationship. Their sexual relationship in their marriage goes dark, and they don't ever really get any answers. So now I'm looking at communication after your intimacy, but in a larger sense, in the larger overarching story of your relationship. After you go through your honeymoon period where you're going through a box of condoms a day— after that's over, are you still communicating with your partner? Let's say you are. And let's say it doesn't go as well as it should. We've been operating on the assumption that either it's going to go well if you discuss things with them afterwards, or it doesn't happen at all and you've just been silent. What if it doesn't go super well? Not so much it goes poorly, but what if you just don't see eye to eye? What if you really enjoyed something and you're really enthusiastic about it and you want to do it again? And what if your partner, not so much, they didn't like it and they don't want to do it again? Maybe they're not mad about it. Maybe they're not upset, but they are not interested in indulging you again and they're not budging. Well, I'm sorry to say that they shouldn't. Or I'm not sorry. Sorry, not sorry. Um, nobody has to do anything, especially once they've confirmed in their own mind that they definitely are not curious anymore. It's one thing if both parties try something with each other that they're both curious about, even if they're skeptical. I'll just, I'll give you an example. I think anal is a very good example, especially for women or anyone who's on the receiving end, because it's just something that you've never tried before, if it's your first time. If it's your first time, then you've never tried it before. And if you want to, there's got to be an element of curiosity there for you. But it's often extremely intimidating. There's a lot of literature out there and also a lot of schoolyard rumor type nonsense that it's bad for you, that it's going to damage you, that you need to take a bunch of precautions, that you're going to somehow embarrass yourself or your partner, that it's extra dangerous health-wise. There's all this stuff out there that it's just not the same as any other sex act. But then a lot of people still want to try it, and they have to rectify all of that in their head with their partner or without them. So then people try it, and it's just not everybody's thing. Not everybody wants to keep doing it. So what if you try it with your partner and they really enjoyed themselves and you did not? And maybe you're glad you did it because now you know. Now you know. You definitely know it's not your thing. And you're glad that you know. But you're also extremely happy that it's over. And now that it is over, because you are smart, you sit down with your partner and you discuss it. And you say, so how'd that go for you? And they say, oh, my God, that was so amazing. That was like the best thing I've ever done. And you are thinking almost the exact opposite. And you have to tell them, oh, that's great. Um, I didn't uh, I, I didn't I didn't think it was that great for me. 
it wasn't that great for me. And I don't think I would want to do it again. For me, I don't think I enjoyed it as much as that, that I would want to do it again. I'm glad I tried it, but I didn't really enjoy it as much as I thought I might. But I'm glad I know that it's just not something that I want to do again. And unfortunately, your partner is going to have to deal with probably some level of disappointment. Because I would be willing to bet that because they enjoyed it so much and it was your first time together, that they're hoping you're going to want to do that again. Now, this scenario can be the groundwork of infidelity if the partner who doesn't want to do this again starts to judge the other partner for liking it. If they say, yeah, that was really gross and it was horrible and you're kind of gross for wanting to do it again. That's where this can go really off the rails. And if this couple doesn't break up, which they should, if that's the direction that it goes in, if they don't break up, cheating is very likely to happen next. And it's going to be easily justified by saying, well, I won't be able to get it at home, so I have to go elsewhere. That's easily how it's going to be justified. The other bad direction it can go in is if the judgment happens the opposite way, is if the partner who enjoyed it starts to judge the other one for not liking it and saying, "Why? what do you mean? You did it. You already did it. You didn't seem like you hated it while it was happening. Why don't you just cooperate, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that can very quickly go into territories of abuse. It's already flat-out intimidation, and uh, obviously it's just wrong. Um, This hypothetical couple that I've made up is uh, problematic in a few different ways, but it's just sort of bringing up the, the various issues that communication should be good but can go wrong very quickly because these are very sensitive topics. So try to handle it carefully. In a non-problematic scenario, our couple would discuss what they did, which in my in my imaginary world was anal, and one of them liked it and one of them didn't, and then they would compare notes on that, be honest with each other, and if they wanted to work out those differences, they would come up with various scenarios to fulfill one of their needs while also accommodating the other one's wants and needs to not participate in anal again. You can do that with toys. You can do that with role play. You can do that with simulation of other types. There's many ways that you can work this out that is not traditional body-on-body contact. And really what it comes down to is just listening to each other and respecting each other's wishes. It's really just that simple. It almost always is. So we've gone through the before, during, and after, but if you're still a little bit lost, come back in a minute and I will try to give you some really specific examples of what you can say to your partner if you find yourself at a loss for words. Are you tired of the same old news? Are you sick of the seemingly endless political spin and negativity? The GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast is a weekly news podcast covering all the top positive and uplifting news stories. We cover stories that will inspire, uplift, and remind you of the good in the world. Tune into the Golden State Media Concepts America Still Beautiful podcast to get all the great and positive news stories of today. Download the GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast on iTunes. Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Hi, folks. Welcome back. It's the GSMC Sex Podcast. I'm Ainsley, and today we're talking about intimate communication. I have a problem with chronic hiccups, and um, uh, I'm not a very very smart person, and I don't have water in my booth, in my my vocal booth, 
because I don't think ahead. And uh, one of my tricks that my stepmother taught me years ago when I was 12 was, is to take seven sips of water. I know this is supposed to be a psychological trick, but then again, I think my chronic hiccups are definitely caused by anxiety. Um, take seven sips of, hi- of, of water uh, with your nose plugged, but I don't have water. I only have coffee. So get ready for a really hyperactive last segment. So earlier we talked about the various communication that you can and should integrate into your life and your relationship before your intimacy, during your intimacy, and after. And I tried to cover a lot of bases. All the bases. First base, second base, third base. Did you get a home run? Sorry, we'll stop the euphemisms. So if you're here in our last section, you might be looking for specific, very specific examples of what to say when you are being intimate or getting intimate. Because I am not someone who is often at a loss for words, obviously. I've ended up in this industry where I talk for a living. People want me to talk, whether it's my own organic words that I pull out of my own brain or words that they write for me on a page. And actually, through that process of asking people, well, what would you like me to say for you? Often they say, we're not sure yet. People have a really hard time writing. Writing is an industry, and people are writers, because other people can't write their own words. I'll be in talks with a very, very small company. Let's say a small startup trying to sell something on Amazon, and they'll want me to do a single line of ad copy And I'll ask them what they want it to be. For a product that I didn't make and don't sell, they made it, they sell it. And I'll ask them what they want me to say, and they have no idea. They have no idea. And then when they finally do get around to trying to tell me what to say, it won't be put in proper sentence structure. They won't follow the necessary limits that they need to follow. They have no, people are unable to put words together. And of course, this notoriously gets worse when people are trying to talk to someone they're attracted to and string words together. I don't think that's any kind of secret. It's, it's, been, a, it's been a teen movie trope for decades. You walk up to a girl you like and, oh, right, that Stan, obviously, that's not words at all. He just walks up to Wendy and pukes at her. Like, just think of that, that alone is all you need to remember. You think that goes away as you get older? I, married couples don't know what to say to each other either, especially being intimate. I don't mean to, like, crush your dreams or anything, but you're not going to get better at sexy talk just with age. That's not something that comes innately to most people. And just because you lock somebody down and just because it's the same person that you have to do sexy talk to doesn't make it any easier. The only thing that makes sexy talk easier because you have to give it to the same recipient over and over is that you know things about them. That's the only thing that makes it easier. The actual construction and execution of sexy talk is all within your own brain. So if you're uncomfortable with it from the get-go, you're going to have to overcome that yourself. And getting comfortable with doing that, of course, a portion of that encompasses being with a certain person. But your partner can't make you do it or make you become comfortable with it. You'll get better at it if you practice, but you do have to start at some point. And again, you'll get more comfortable with it if you are better at it because you know your partner well. Because you'll be able to do and say things that you know they definitely, definitely like and respond to. So a lot of it does have to do with your partner. But again, it's only because you know and connect with them so well. It's not because they're doing anything for you. I'll call back again to the first guy who prompted me to talk dirty. 
he didn't do anything for me, I realized that I actually had a lot of capability and capacity to do that already. I just was never with the right partner before him. And I was responding to something that he was able to not only prompt me to do, but was able to be continuous, not just with him, but with future partners. So with all that being said, the point is that if you're still uncomfortable being vocal at all, not just with dirty talk, but with communication about intimacy with your partner, it is something that you can work up to and practice. And yes, sometimes it is about your partner and not just about yourself. There are definitely people that will stifle you and make you feel uncomfortable or even actively shame you about trying to communicate this type of stuff. And just know that that's not okay. And you may want to look at the overall health of your relationship if you find yourself feeling that way. So the things that you can say or that you can work up to saying are simple things, or at least let's start with the simple things. Let's start with yes. You can just say yes. Yes is good. It's very clear. And it typically means what it means, especially if all parties have discussed things beforehand. Yes is also a word that works if you find yourself scrambling for any other type of words. If you find yourself at a loss for getting any more specific, but you want to clearly communicate that things are going well. If you want to pull a When Harry Met Sally, you can start screaming yes over and over and over again. If you're concerned about noise, Scream yes into a pillow. That's pretty unambiguously positive. And I think most partners would be able to decipher that as a message of encouragement. That's just my take. If you're bold enough, you can add other things to yes, and you can start to get a little more specific, such as, yes, that is good. Because despite what we discussed earlier with certain people being bad listeners and not paying attention during sexual acts because they get very distracted, there's also a different brand of distraction during a sexual act, which is overly focusing on the response of your partner, so much so that it distracts you from what you're actually doing. It's a problem that's oddly offensive to me, where I've, I've thought, can you stop? Can you stop focusing so hard on me and just pay attention to me for a minute? It's, it's an odd paradox that can be challenging to get out of once you're inside of it. And it, again, it largely has to do with self-consciousness and ego because one person becomes so consumed with pleasing their partner. And I could be wrong, but I think some of these situations could be be avoided if there was increased communication. Because I acknowledge that some of these issues are caused by egos that are too fragile and people that are looking for so much validation that no one could give them what they're looking for. But I'm sure that there are a certain percentage of people that are left too much in the dark, and so they get confused about whether or not what they're doing is okay. And they are looking for legitimate communication and validation from their partner just to continue so that they know that everything is good. Because consent is sexy. So what can you say other than yes, and that is good? Because that sometimes that's enough. Because partners like that who are just looking for your validation and consent, not only are they paying attention to you, but they're paying attention to themselves and what they're doing. So if they are paying attention to what they're doing and they're waiting for your response, they're going to log that. They're logging that. They're thinking, okay, I'm doing this thing, and I hope it's working. I hope it's working. I hope it's working. And then they hear you say, oh, yeah, that's good. And they're like, oh, it's working. Yes. So your affirmation in the moment can be extremely important, but only if your partner's really listening. Now, that scenario is assuming that your partner is on the right track. What if they're not? <laughs> what if they got lost? The word no is tricky and should probably be reserved for situations where it really applies as a hard line. 
redirection tends to work better in situations where you're legitimately just trying to redirect somebody. So phrases like touch me here are very helpful in redirection of a partner when you're asking for something. Speaking of questions, some people find questions and the dynamic of asking permission very, very sexy. That's something that you and your partner may or may not need to outline and discuss ahead of time because it's heavily role-oriented. And that's where we get into things like role-play and fantasies and everything like that. But on the surface, it really is a simple redirection and a request for your partner to do something that you want them to do. And you're making your needs known. And there are several different ways you can do it without offending them or telling them that they've done anything wrong. Maybe they've done nothing wrong. There's a good chance that they didn't do anything wrong. There's a bunch of other ways you can make requests also. You can say, use this on me. If you've got toys or a lubricant, or you can even be referring to a part of their body, you can say, I'm going to do this to you before you do something. That's also a way of asking permission Depending on the dynamics of your relationship, only you can really know how your dynamics really work. Because if you say that to your partner, depending on how everything is set up in the moment, it gives them a chance to redirect you or flat out object. You can phrase it differently. You can say, what if I did this to you? Or I'm going to do this to you. And then gauge their reaction or give them a chance to respond. You can get much more specific in bed than you think you can, and you can come right out and say things like, do you want to do this? In my experience, men are not looking for ambiguity. They're looking for clear sexual language, and many people have really specific words and phrases that they like to hear. And if you ask your partner, they might tell you, and you might be surprised at what you hear. I had an audio client once who wanted to hear me say something along the lines of hot damn, and that, that was the extent of it, and he wanted to hear it a lot. The rest of the material was very erotic and sexually charged, but the actual phrase that he wanted to hear my voice say was something like damn or hot damn. You'd be surprised what some people want to hear. And so if you ask your partner what it is and assure them that you're not going to judge them when they tell you, it might just be something that you're not expecting. Other things that I find very useful as sexually suspenseful and erotic in the moment are basically a lot of hypotheticals. And I've already used some of them here. They're phrases that pose a lot of situations that haven't happened yet. And there are things like, what if this happened? Maybe I could do this. What if you did that? Well, I guess I could. And really, the beauty of this whole device is that it creates a whole bunch of instant fantasies for you and your partner to explore and then, in real time, you can figure out which one of these things is the most useful and interesting to you, and then potentially pick one and, and just do it. It's almost like sexual verbal roulette. It's very useful. One more, and I, I guess anybody could do this, but it works especially well with um, someone who's going to get into a sexy outfit. You put your partner somewhere like in a chair, in the, in the living room or something. Just put, it, put them somewhere, sit them down, and just say, wait here, and then leave. And then just go and do whatever you're going to do. Brush your teeth, change your clothes, brush your hair, take a two-hour shower. I don't know. I don't know what order Grubhub. I'm not sure what you're doing, but <laughs> make us sit them down and tell them to wait. They'll probably wait if you just need to say it the right way. Wait right here. Oh, they'll wait. They'll wait. And if they don't, let them leave. Jeez. And then go make a TikTok and inform the world 
that if you sat someone down and said, wait right here, and then they didn't wait, you didn't want them to stay anyway. I don't have a TikTok. They won't let me have one. Thanks for listening, folks. This has been the GSMC Sex Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. Make sure you follow us and get notifications for new episodes wherever you get your podcasts. And follow us on the socials like Facebook, Instagram, but not TikTok, because I don't know how to use that. You can search for us by looking for GSMC or me, Ainsley Caswell. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Sex Podcast, part of the GSMC Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type in GSMC to find all of our shows from the GSMC Podcast Network. From sex and relationships to health and wellness, life and happiness, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's episode of the Golden State Media Concepts Sex Podcast.